Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Everybody's recovering from the Christmas overdose. <laughs> yes, everybody, nobody's killed their kids, right? They're home on Christmas break. I got one more week of that wonderfulness. <laughs> My name is Jessica, and I get to be the um, growth group director here at Bridgeway, and I'm just absolutely honored to be able um, to speak to you guys today. I want you to think back with me um, about five or six weeks to Thanksgiving Day. Just kind of picture it in your head where you're around a table and you are just overcome with great gratefulness at um, what God has done this year, you know, the food that's before you, the family that's around you, and he has just met all our needs. We don't need anything more. We have everything we ever wanted. And then the next day, we head to malls all across America and do our annual Black Friday pilgrimage to buy more crap we don't need. And then the day after Black Friday is Small Business Saturday. Did you know this? Where you are supposed to buy from local stores instead of the big box stores and support local business people. It's really just a way that we trick ourselves and saying, well, it says support. I mean, this is basically a donation. You know, like you're, you're justifying your shopping the next day. And then we have Cyber Monday, where we get to do the same financial damage that we did on Black Friday, only in our pajamas and watching cheesy Hallmark movies at the same time. It's all so ridiculous. And then after we've shopped ourselves silly, the day after Christmas, all the Walmarts are filled with all the people with all the stuff to return it. Yes, the whole cycle is absolutely fascinating to me. <laughs> it just ends up back at Walmart, like you should just save the trip. Anyway, according to People Magazine, 54% of all gifts are exchanged or returned or altered, whatever that means. 22% of men are exchanging gifts this year and 19% of women. So for women, the top three gifts they exchange are sweets, which is candy, gum, and chocolates, and then toddler clothing, which we're going to assume wasn't meant for them, and they're exchanging sweaters. The top three gifts that men exchange are sweets, candy, gum, and chocolate, um, dress shirts, and athletic apparel. Now, in reading this, if the first question comes to your head that comes to mind, it is, who on this earth is returning gum? Like, you are getting gum and saying, no thanks, I'd rather have the 96 cents. That is hilarious. So I was thinking about the whole idea of losing our minds going shopping when half of all these gifts are going to be returned anyway. And I began to think of the more common reasons for exchanging gifts. So like it's either too big, it doesn't fit, it's broken, we might already have one and we don't need two, um, it's uncomfortable, all pretty good reasons that people might return a Christmas gift. Sometimes we are handed situations in life that we would like to exchange for those same reasons, aren't we? Many times someone will tell us, look at this gift, look at this as a gift from God. And you're just kind of like, I, I really want to slap you right now. Because, like, say you just lost your job and somebody says, well, you've been given the gift of time. And you're like, yeah, but i got to be given the gift of a paycheck or I'm going to have the gift of broke. And, you know, so people are trying to make you make lemonade out of the lemons, but it's just not quite that easy. So let's look at a few reasons for a gift exchange and how we can relate them to our spiritual lives. One reason that comes to mind for gift exchange is that it is the wrong size. Maybe it is a shirt or something that is too big. Now, sometimes situations occur and you think they're just too big for you and you would like to return them. They are Goliath-like situations, and you feel very much like David, who's looking around for a stone to throw at it, with your mind wandering if you have enough damage to do some to enough ammo to do some damage to this problem. You feel like a real man or woman needs to be doing this, and not you. You're just a kid, totally unprepared, not skilled enough to attack it. But I assure you, you are more prepared than you think, and you'll have exactly what you need for the battle. In 1 Samuel 17, 34, after Samuel was trying to tell David he was absolutely insane for thinking that he could take down Goliath, David said to Saul, 
Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. David reached back in his faith and drew from past experiences where God didn't fail him. And sometimes we think we're not capable to fight a battle when all along God is preparing us for that very moment. You see, had David not spent so much time herding sheep, he never would have had developed the stone-slinging skills he needed to kill Goliath. He was just doing his job, and it was a really boring job at that. You just can't get much more boring than watching sheep eat and sleep. And he would do it for days and days on end. But he had no idea that that boring job was preparing him for such a battle. You never know what you're doing right now in your life that is preparing you for what's ahead. I can look back at every job I had beginning in high school and how each prepared me for something else in my life. Waiting tables taught me to serve others well. Driving a school bus, it happened, taught me how to focus in the midst of sheer chaos. Helping to run a kids' camp gave me organizational skills that I still use today. And I might call my kids' camp Aviles because of it. Being a sous chef in a gourmet restaurant taught me to have high standards for the work that I turned out. And the list goes on and on from lessons I learned as an elementary school teacher, as an admin assistant, as a youth pastor, as a missionary living in a third world country. And I'm sure you guys can make your own list and just go down and list jobs and what you learned from that job, whether you liked it or not. Sometimes when you're in the middle of a job, parts of it seem monotonous. and You don't realize that you're still learning and you're still preparing. You, don't think, you think you're just watching sheep and slinging stones, but you don't know that your target practice is preparing you to take down Goliath. So take heart. A too big situation doesn't necessarily need to be exchanged. It needs to be won, and you are more prepared than you think. Another reason we might exchange a gift is that it doesn't work or it's broken. Today, it has become so easy to walk away from anything that is broken, mostly because things are easily re replaceable nowadays. When my parents were kids, when small appliances were broken, they took it to the repair shop, the fix-it shop. The whole idea of the shop was to fix small appliances. If an iron or a blender or a toaster was broken, they would take it to the repair shop, and a few days later, it would come back to them fixed. Nowadays, it's become so easy to just replace rather than repair. Has anybody in here in the last decade taken an iron in to get it fixed? No, it sounds ridiculous. It's just easier and just as cheap to buy a new iron, and then you don't have to wait for the repair to come back. It's instant. You have a new, a new working iron right now. I'm afraid we've transferred that line of thinking to relationships as well. There are many times that someone offends us, and instead of trying to work it out, we just stop talking to them. Unfriending someone on Facebook is just a click of a button. So easy, and poof, they disappear. If there's a broken relationship in your life, instead of going straight to returning it or getting yourself a new one, perhaps we should work on repairing it first. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and tenderhearted to one another, one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. Ephesians 4.2 says, To be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. And Colossians 3.12 says, You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Perhaps a broken relationship should be repaired and not returned. A third reason a gift is exchanged is that we don't like or want it, like those of you who are returning gum. 
Many times we find ourselves in situations that we don't like or we don't want. And as mentioned earlier, maybe you've lost a job or there's been a diagnosis that you would love to return. Maybe you've had to bury someone way earlier than you thought. You're in a situation that you don't want to be in, and inevitably some well-meaning friend will walk up to you and say nine words that sound like scripture, but in fact are not. God won't give you more than you can handle. I'd like to propose that we edit this out of the Christian book of sayings. <laughs> there are many situations in life that you can find yourself in that are way bigger than you can handle on your own. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. God can shoulder it with us and carry us through it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, Paul writes, so to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. You can be in situations that in your own strength are more than you can handle. But God will give you all the grace you need in every situation you face. There are situations you absolutely cannot handle alone, but in him you can bear the load. Another reason we might exchange a Christmas gift is that we already have one. This became a reality for my husband last Monday when he unwrapped a gift from my mom that was a burgundy sweater while he was wearing a burgundy sweater. This happens sometimes with your kids when they might get the same toy from two different grandmas or something and nobody needs two pie-in-the-face games. If you do, I have one you can use. In life, we may be in a situation where we think we're already shouldering a huge burden, and then all of a sudden, more is piled on top. Maybe you're in a financial crisis, and then an unexpected medical bill pops up. Or maybe you're having health issues, and then you get another diagnosis on top of it. Or the burgundy sweater of kids' situations. Maybe one kid has been really acting up, and now another one starts. And you're like, no, 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 no. You are the good one. It's his turn. You cannot also be bad at the same time. You have to wait your turn. It makes me think about the story of Job and how the bad times just kept getting piled on top of one another. And it just seemed like a, it got to a point where it seems like a joke. In Job 1, beginning in verse 13, it says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the old brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking... Another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They've put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking... Yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with the wrongdoing. Let's look at that last verse one second. This further justifies my previous motion to edit out. God doesn't give you more than you can handle because it says here, Job did not sin by charging God with the wrongdoing. God didn't give it to us anyway. He doesn't give you a bad situation, and according to what we just read, we shouldn't accuse him of such. I have struggled, like many of you, and the whole why did God allow this scenario has run through my head. And I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do know this. 
God does not have a stack of cards, and some people get jokers, and some people have aces, and some of us are scrambling with a bad hand and trying to live out the hand we're dealt, while others of us are walking around with a royal flush. The fact of the matter is that because of sin, we live in a fallen world. And as a result of that, there's hunger, there's sickness, there's death, there's sins against one another, and there are broken relationships. And I believe to my core that how we handle that becomes our gift to God. Let's look back at our friend Job. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, He still maintained his integrity, and God was bragging about him to Satan. Now, who wants to be bragged on by God? That's pretty awesome, but he's still human. And for 34 more chapters, he's arguing with his friends about how bad his life is until God comes down in chapter 38 and tells him to cut it out. You can read the book of Job on your own if you want to feel better about your own life. But the bottom line is, if bad becomes worse, instead of blaming and complaining, try allowing God to work through it. Hold on to hope through the doubt and praise him regardless, and this is your gift to him. The last reason you might want to return a gift is that it's uncomfortable. Maybe someone bought you a new pair of shoes or a coat or a burgundy sweater that just doesn't fit right or it itches and it's uncomfortable, so you want to return it. Sometimes in life we are thrown into situations that are uncomfortable or require an uncomfortable amount of faith. It just doesn't feel good, and so you want out. You want to return it. There was a video that went viral a while back by a rabbi named Dr. Abraham Tversky, and he spoke about a lobster and how inside of a lobster shell he's very mushy and fleshy, and the only way he knows that he's growing is if he becomes uncomfortable in his shell. So his flesh is growing, but his shell is still constraining him. So when he knows that he's hit a growth spurt, he goes under a rock and sheds that shell, and then he grows a new one, and comes back out from under the rock, and he lobsters around until he feels the pressure once again. The pressure, the uncomfortableness, indicated growth. And that is true for us, too. Sometimes when we feel that uncomfortableness and that pressure, we're actually in a growth spurt. And we know that it's time to grow and get a bigger shell. How you handle it, choosing to grow through adversity instead of wallowing in it, becomes your gift back to God. James 1, 2-4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So those are the different reasons that mean we might want to return a Christmas gift applied to our lives. Now, there are times when you go to a store and you want to return a gift, but now it's on sale, so you don't get the full value of it. You want to return a $40 shirt, now they have it clearanced out at 99 cents, and so it's better to just keep it. I think that sometimes we've been in situations, and some of you are in them now, where given a choice, we'd rather return it. But might I suggest that the trade-in value is less than if you would keep it and work through it. You might learn more. The lessons you learn might be more valuable to you and grow you better than if you had just traded it back in. I'm going to switch gears for just a second, and instead of talking about situations that we might like to exchange, talk about the great exchange that happened 2,000 years ago when our sin was exchanged for his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther said this, Therefore, my dear brother, learn Christ and him crucified. Learn to pray to him and despairing of yourself say, Thou, Lord Jesus, art my righteousness, but I am thy sin. Thou hast taken upon thyself what thou wast not, and given me what I was not. The great exchange allows all other exchanges to be possible. The great exchange allows us to boldly approach the throne and to exchange your past for your future. 
Sometimes when you're on the other end of a gift exchange, when someone wants to exchange a gift you gave them, and you're the gift giver and the gift isn't received well, it can be a bit of a bummer. Every year as a mom, like most moms, I stress out trying to create the perfect Christmas experience for my kids. We do all the shopping and all the wrapping and all the cookies and all the all of it. And you get it under the tree just to see your kids' faces light up at Christmas. One year I did all of the things And on December 26th, I woke up to my children doing a puppet show using popsicle sticks. As a gift giver, you want your gifts to be received and appreciated and loved, not tossed to the side. It's no different with our Heavenly Father. The gift he gave us all is the most valuable gift anyone has ever given us, the gift of eternal life. And this gift came at a great cost. So for us to reject it or to complain that it isn't enough seems a bit like kids playing with popsicle sticks when they have a room full of brand new toys. And trust me, I get it. I don't know your situation. And some of you this whole time I'm talking have been in your head going, yeah, but, and I've lived in the yeah, buts. We all, we, we all have yeah, buts. Yeah, but my marriage is in trouble. Yeah, but my kids are out of control. Yeah, but we just got this diagnosis. Yeah, but I don't see a way out of this financial crisis. At our most recent prayer night here at Bridgeway, I was sitting in about the second row, and I had my head down, and I was praying hard, and I was praying earnestly. And I was just begging God for a miracle. And I remember saying to the Lord, literally, I hate that I'm so beggy with you these days. And I just felt this, then stop. Stop begging for a healing and rejoice that death isn't the end. You see, the great exchange creates the greatest exchange of all, which is an exchange in perspective. Stop begging God for miraculous healing and thank him that death isn't the end. You might not be able to return your too big, uncomfortable, overbearing, busted up situation. But because of the great exchange, you can exchange your perspective. So instead of living in doubt, praise God for hope. Instead of wallowing in the status of a relationship that's gone horribly wrong, thank God that his mercies are new every morning. Instead of complaining about closed doors, thank him for open windows. Exchanging perspective can exchange everything. In 2018, we don't have to live like we did in 2017. As I said, one of the wonderful benefits of the great exchange is exchanging our past for our future. We can be intentional about a new beginning in the new year, a year of intentional time with the Father. The time is what creates the exchange. Sometimes you feel as if your nerves are coming undone like unraveling yarn. But when you weave the yarn with the power of his presence and being in it, it becomes a strong, useful garment. In 2018, what do you want to exchange? A heavy load? Matthew 11:28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. His presence creates that exchange. You want to trade out a broken heart? Psalm 147.3 says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. His present creates that exchange. You want to trade guilt and shame for forgiveness? Romans 8.1-2 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For those who are in Christ Jesus, his presence creates that exchange. You want to trade anxiety for peace? John 14, 27 says, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's a big one for me. A sweet friend reminded me that peace isn't an option. It's a command. It's a gift. 
Don't play around with popsicle sticks worrying about splinters when you've been given the gift of peace. If we aren't living in peace, then we are not tapped into what he has to offer. His peace is perfect, but we have to spend time with him in order to walk in it. His presence creates that exchange. I could go on and on. His presence exchanges rest for weariness, self-control for anger, a fresh start for a broken relationship, faith where there was doubt. His presence is a game changer where exchanges can be made. You can trade your sorrow for joy, which given some real life circumstances seems insane. But it's not joy because of the circumstance, it's joy in spite of it. But you have to be in his presence. I can't explain it, I can describe it, and it makes a difference. It makes you okay in the midst of circumstances that are most definitely not okay. We just sang good, good father, and one of the, one of the lines said, peace so unexplainable, I can hardly think. But then it says, you call me deeper still. You have to be in his presence for the exchange to take place. As we close, I want you to close your eyes. Shut everyone out, please, and just really think about what you want 2018 to look like. I'd like for you to think about, or maybe even go home and list, the exchanges that need to be made in the coming year and the returns that you should stick out and work through. You can't change the situation, but you can change your perspective. Do you need to try to repair a broken relationship instead of replacing it? In order to do that, you need to exchange anger for self-control, maybe anxiety for peace. His presence creates that exchange. Is there a problem that's just too big? It's a Goliath of a problem and you are scared. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. But to walk in perfect love, you have to spend time with the giver of that love. His presence creates that exchange. Are you in a situation you don't want to be in? There's no way out. You're trapped. And you have no choice in 2018 but to buckle up and go through it. Do you need to trade out sorrow for joy in spite of your circumstances? Spend time with him. His presence creates that exchange. His presence doesn't always calm the storm, but he can calm you in it. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus for the great exchange. I thank you that his sacrifice allows us to make all other exchanges. I ask as we close out 2017 and look ahead to what you have for us, that you'll speak to us, that you'll call us into your presence where exchanges are made. Father, I have no idea what's going to happen in each of our lives this year, what our lives will look like on December 31st, 2018. But it doesn't take you by surprise. And we ask, Father, that you lead and guide and direct our steps to glorify you in the midst of returnable situations that we can't return. To grow when we need to grow. To sling stones when we need to sling stones. To give you the honor and the glory no matter what the circumstance. Look forward to what you have ahead for us, the testimonies that come this year and all the good you are doing in the midst of this broken world. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.